This is the Ross Developers Podcast, episode 40. The Ross Developers Podcast, the Ross Developers. Hi, Ross Developers, and welcome to the Ross Developers Podcast, the program, the podcast that give you insights from the experts about how to program your robots with Ross. This is Ricardo here speaking from The Construct, and today I would like to dedicate the podcast to all of those Ross developers working with industrial robots that do not have a Ross interface, so they have to keep using the factory SDK. So, uh, yeah, we are really sorry for you and uh, we hope that this situation changes in the close future. This episode is dedicated to you. And today we are going to interview Alexander Rossler. Alexander is a solopreneur, it means uh, an entrepreneur at present with a, in a team of one. And he is providing services for developing embedded systems and human machine interfaces at his company that is called Rossler Systems. He has a very interesting blog called Ma Machine Coder with K Coder, where he posts about development for robots using open source tools. And recently, he published a, a post about how to use Blender to animate industrial robots. And that is why I thought that it would be interesting to hear this and how that uh, how that works and his whys and hows about that subject. Welcome to the podcast, Alexander. Hello, Ricardo. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, then I saw your post that you posted on your uh, I think in this course of Ross discourse and. And I was quickly att uh, attracted to that. It was there that you posted? Yes. So I reposted basically my uh, blog post on uh, Ross Discourse. Okay. As it was in Machine, machine Coder first, and then you po reposted on, on this course. Yes, exactly. And the subject is uh, very, very interesting. So it's how to create animations for industrial robots specifically for industrial robots using Blender. Let's explain to the listeners what is Blender. So uh, Blender is basically a 3D creation suite, uh, mostly used for 3D animation. Uh, some also use it for actually creating 3D models and uh, using uh, basic creating 3D art, 3D graphics. So uh, let's say if you, uh, you're uh, taking a look at a product picture on the internet, mm -hmm. there's a high chance that it might be a rendering of something. And mm -hmm. uh, Blender is probably the most popular software, uh, the most popular open source software uh, for 3D modeling, 3D animation, and so on. In my opinion, it's also a very um, high quality software. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, most advanced open source software, uh, which is um, pr um, tools that, that, that you can uh, get. So it's also used by professionals, uh, not, not only by hobbyists, it's also used mm -hmm. by uh, movie studios and so on. So it's a very, uh, actually very advanced uh, software uh, when you're into 3D graphics in China. I think that you showed a video in your post about um, that there is from a Lucasfilm also that they are using this for producing their, their pictures, that they are using Blender, is that? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, there, if, if you go, go on YouTube and Google for Blender movies uh, and so on, you'll find a, a few movies uh, actually produced for, uh, for from the Blender team uh, as open source movies. But mm -hmm. there are also like um, real uh, professionals talking about uh, using Blender, for example, uh, to create the dinosaurs uh, or a dinosaur okay. for Jurassic Park and so on. So uh, it's actually used in, in real movies as well. So uh, it's really great application of open source software, in my opinion. Okay, but it would be closer. So Blender would be closer to 
SolidWorks or it would be closer to 3D Studio, for example? Which one? Uh, uh, closer to, to 3D Studio. So uh, it's, okay. I think it's more, more used um, for animation and 3D uh, creation of 3D art than for construction. So okay. it's not uh, not like SolidWorks or AutoCAD or and so on. Not so much used for actually construction of uh, uh, technical models. It's more used oh. for for art models, uh, general 3D models, uh, and so on. So okay. uh, I, I personally use it uh, a little bit for uh, for modeling as well, uh, but. For for more technical parts, uh, mostly use like uh, other software. So it's mo uh, the application is mostly for three uh, D animation, three D uh, rendering, three D uh, everything that is more uh, the directions uh, of art um, and and entertainment. Uh, not so much for engineering. But it could also be used by engineers, of course. Yes, I have used in the sense that you mentioned for creating models for the gazebo simulation. So I needed a desk for my simulation, and then I uh, I have used the Blender, but it, it's amazing software. I, I can tell you, but uh, so I agree with you that is 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 an amazing software. So you, listeners, if you are there and you haven't tried yet, I recommend you that you try it. It's open source, and I, I think it's also available in all the platforms, in in Windows, Mac, and Linux. Yeah, you know. Y yes, yes, exactly. It's uh, on all the major platforms. Uh, it's very well supported on all the platforms, so it's not running better on one particular platform. So if you're using Linux like me, then it works perfectly. If you're using Windows or Mac, it also works perfectly. So it uh, has very good support on all platforms. Yeah, impressive. And um, then, OK, so now we know what is Blender. OK, so that's the software that we are going to use to animate industrial robots. Then. Now the question is, uh, why? Why do we need to animate an industrial robot? Yes, uh, so that, that that's an interesting question here. Uh, actually, um, a, a friend uh, told me uh, about like Blender in general, and especially about the new Blender 2.8 release, which is currently in the uh, as a beta release, and how it's so nice because they redesigned everything and uh, they made it more accessible for new users and also. Um, one important feature, in my opinion, which I probably talk about later, they uh, added a new rendering engine, which uh, enables uh, live rendering, which is almost photorealistic, which is really wow. cool when you have when you do like uh, 3D animation. But I think it's also cool uh, when you're working with uh, more advanced robotics, when you're going in the direction of machine learning and so on. I think it could be very, very interesting uh, for this application. So yeah, so basically. Uh, he told me, yeah, Blender is very interesting and, and very uh, nice software. I should check it out. Um, okay. And I had this industrial robot uh, standing around. So I have an industrial robot, which I have uh, for a project to work with, so to try out uh -huh. things and so on. And I thought, mm, uh, what's a good a, a possible approach to, to program in the, an industrial robot for uh, all sorts of purposes? And one of the ideas was, uh, why not try to animate the robot, like not not like normal robot programming, where you have to either teach the program or move the industrial robot around and save the positions, or you use some kind of robot programming language, mm -hmm. um, which is a whole nother topic to talk about probably. Uh, but basically, you have to type in code, and it's usually not very convenient to work with. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, there are already existing uh, 3D programming suits for robots out there, which do like where you can um, basically program a, a robot in a 3D virtualized environment. Uh, I mean, Ross has movie uh, has movie it with an Arvis. The combination yes. of the, uh, those two uh, is probably close, but it's not uh, uh, out of the box ready to actually do a whole programming of, of complex programs, um, but in the end, um, I think that a very interesting part for animating robots is when you really want to um, have a robot um, move uh, in a certain way um, and you want to define how it moves. So usually when you do a, a robot programming, you're more uh, about getting from getting point A uh, to point P and uh -huh. you let them figure out how to get from A to B itself. 
uh, versus animation is more the other way around. So if you really want to control yeah. how it moves and so on, then it's an interesting approach. Okay, so but that you approach, might, yeah. I oh, sorry to interrupt you. So, the, but that approach means that this yep. uh, movement it's going to be let's say hard coded. So it it's it's a fixed movement. Instead, if we use, for example, move it that is planning, then it's not. Uh, if you are uh, allowing to introduce the sensor data, then it's going to be able to react. If it detects an obstacle in the middle, for example, there is a person in the middle of the movement, then uh, in that case, the, the animation that we create with uh, Blender is going to be fixed. So it's going to crash against the person also. Yes, so, so in this case, uh, right now, the current state, uh, what I've done with Blender so far is, is fixed. So there is no fixed. option here to, to adapt if, uh, during movement. So it's probably not the best, uh, most suitable ap application for this kind of situation. Uh, it's more really for, for, for the kind of situations where you really want to have a fixed uh, program, which mm -hmm. should behave in some certain behavior. Okay, yes, I, I hear, for example, an example of those animations uh, were used in the movies also. And uh, I don't remember the name of this movie. It's a movie of uh, Keanu Reeves that he fights and with swords. And then what they did is to uh, bring a big, very big uh, armed robot and they attach mm -hmm. the camera to the end effector. And then they they define completely the sequence of movements that the camera has to do in order to capture the action but it was fixed so they can't replay it any time so and it always will have a, 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 the same sequence of movements so the camera will capture always in the same way but they can make the actors do it one way or another again and again and repeat and always have the same animation and put the camera in some positions that it's impossible to put a, a person with a camera in those positions, like in on the ceiling, but then going down and then going to the side and making all this. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's all, uh, it's also the, the uh, major applications for this is in general, um, very really want to have a fixed movement, which should behave in exactly your defined behavior. Uh -huh. And this is, entertainment technology. So that's basically uh, what you already mentioned, like uh, filming movies is uh, one possible application. Um, the advantage here compared to uh, offline programming where you uh, say the mov uh, robot from moving from A to B is actually that you can have your 3D environment prepared. Mm -hmm. And since movies nowadays are mostly like, I would say 50, 60% CGI effects anyway, mm -hmm. uh, you can do that in one environment. So. Um, Interesting at this uh, at this time there's also um, Autodesk is working on on a plugin for the Maya software which is uh, a closed sourced um, 3D animation uh, software which is I think it's mostly used for um, for movie for cinematic uh, applications uh -huh. uh, and they also bring out uh, 3D uh, robot programming plugin right now. So it's very interesting uh, coincidence uh, mm -hmm. here. Um, but this cost software costs, I think, 3000 euros per year or so. And, uh, <laughs> and that is, really of course, it's, it's, it's rather expensive. But if you're into this in, in the industry, it might not be that expensive for you because yeah, it's an expense that you have anyways. But on the other hand, uh, if you want to play around with open source software, then of course, that's not a good option. Um, <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. So in so general, yeah. Go go ahead. Uh, in general, I think uh, entertainment, not only movies, uh, also some kind of uh, artistic applications, um, live uh, robot being used for in general for um, also for uh, sc screen basically screenplays where we can use it uh, to do lighting and, and things like that. Or uh, also possible application is, of course, animatronics. Hmm. Uh, yes. It's, like most, it's mostly entertainment here, yeah. For example, pepper. Uh, for example, for... yes. That might be another interesting application, actually, to do, uh, do partial programming. They really want to have like a certain behavior. 
let's say a, a gesture for for PayPal, uh, which does whatever like a, a gesture where you, it mm -hmm. shows you some kind of expression. And there might, this might be a really uh, interesting application because like here you want your robot to do something in a certain way yes. and you could use this part that you have animated and use it in your ROS application, for example, and yeah. uh, start this animation and your robot, uh, for example, presents something like does a presenting move or, uh, or some kind of uh, facial expression or whatever. It's, uh, exactly. There are lots of possibilities here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I see the applications. And the, le, let me clarify to the listeners that we are talking about arms. Okay, so now at present, uh, we are not talking about uh, any other, like a face or a torso. We are not talking about that, only for arms. Uh, well, um, I, I've, my example uh, I've, I've presented in the blog post is uh, for a six degrees of freedom uh, industrial yeah. robot arm. But Blender itself can be used for any kind of creature, so to speak. So um, you could animate all sorts of things. It could be uh, something like an arm, for example, but it could be a, a head, a whole human body. It could be okay. uh, yeah. something Makes more sense. abstract, like a worm, yeah. uh, whatever. It's, it could yes. be anything. So yeah, that's that. You are completely right. Yes, that's right. And then you use the industrial robot because you had that one available for you. That's just an example. Exactly. Okay, it's okay. because I have an industrial robot available and no, I don't know, no snake robot or whatever. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. And then how do you, did you put the uh, model of the robot inside Blender? Did you have to create by yourself or c could we, for example, use the URDF model made in, in ROS for a specific robot and just import it directly inside Blender? Yeah. So in this case, I, uh, put the model together myself. Uh, so a short explanation here in, in uh, Blender, we have something called um, armature and an armature has bones. And a bone can be uh, thought of like something like a link in, in, in UDF. Okay. And then we have the joints, joints which are at the ends of the bone, so to speak. So you have to do the representation uh, in a way that's uh, used by Blender. And, and UD, uh, UDF uh, could be used. I mean, there are like two projects that actually try to um, approach this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there is one uh, which you can use for creating actually the UDF. It's called Phobos, I think. Oh, yes, It was an Phobos. open source project. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I know about that one. Yeah, so you in, in Phobos, you create a model in in Blender from scratch, yeah. and then you export into URDF. Exactly, and here we would have the a model already in, in Blender, which you okay. can use, for example, for this application. Um, the other project there is um, a simulation software called Mars, uh, which is placed based, based on uh, Blender game engine. Uh, which is unfortunately right now not supported by Blender 2.8. Uh, but there's an issue on GitHub uh, where they're talking about importing URDFs. And some people already uh, worked on basic, okay, it's also written in Python. Um, we're talking about how to import UDFs. Uh, and I think there are already some uh, not complete solutions, basically. Uh, so when you think about <laughs> what an UDF can represent and so on, it's uh, it's a lot. It's not only uh, robot arms. It's, I think, yeah. uh, a, a lot and more and arms. That, yeah, exactly. So it uh, it would be very comp complex to um, be able to import any kind of UDF. So uh, if you constrain it to say, let's uh, robot arm, for example, I think it would be very straightforward to do that. Um, right now, I, I haven't uh, played around with it too much, but. Um, in the future, it might be an interesting thing to have, like just click import UDF and yes, exactly. be able to animate it. Yeah, that would be super cool because it will simplify a lot of things. And then yeah. uh, the uh, so you are planning some movements with the uh, with the robot, so some sequences of movements. And then how, how do you do that? So do you use a specific interface to 
specify the trajectories or you have to go join by join setting the values of every joint so how does it work so yes um, it, um, when you animate things uh, with blender um, and especially things like creatures arms uh, and all sorts of things that have armatures and bones and you mm -hmm. have two ways to do that one is to move each bone one by one okay. that's what you would do, uh, I think you would mostly do that when you really want to have like a very specific movement here as well. Exactly. Um, but yeah, for most applications, that it's uh, in my opinion not as useful because it's a lot of work to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, but on the other hand, you can use the other approach where you uh, use inverse. So basically, it would be the this approach would be. Uh, something like forward kinematics. It's called okay. uh, forward kinematics in, 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 in Blender as well. Uh, and the other approach would be inverse kinematics. So basically, you have a target, and your armature um, should point, or actually, uh, the bone where you apply this inverse kinematics constraint should um, face a certain target, which could be like uh, a, a crosshair, for example, or a uh, an object or a location or something like that. Okay. Yes. So that's uh, if you compare it to uh, with, with something that's in ROS, uh, that would be pretty similar to um, the Move It um, plugin for for Arvis, where you have this yes. thing you can drag around this bulb. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's similar to that. Um, uh -huh. And the the difference here is just a Blender is made for for animations. So you have very um, precise uh, control over how it should behave. So you could have, um, if you want, you could have very um, via, um, organic movement, which is nice for a hand, like a human hand or something like that. Uh, but it can also have very rigid movement, where you want to have um, the, the arm or something. Yeah, exactly. Move very um, in, in a very certain way, so to speak. Yeah. And that's uh -huh. that's very interesting when you really want to control uh, what the arm is always doing. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And what about the a little bit of the yeah? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, you wanted to add uh, something? Uh, yes. Uh, so so basically, uh, a downside of this uh, of Blender is, of course, it's uh, more targeted for for non uh, scientific or non engineering applications. So the mm -hmm. defaults are very uh, mostly designed for characters or something. Yeah, uh, so you need to do a lot of, of tuning here. And that's also where I spent uh, a lot of uh, time uh, working with this or, or experimenting with it, getting the right settings. So it behaves like an industrial robot and not like uh, a human arm or a snake or a yeah, Disney, a Disney, a Disney industrial robot, you know, like the version of Disney. Of. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, but uh, so you mentioned two ways of animating the robot, but uh, in your um, blog you also indicated a third method that it's called animation nodes. That is nothing to do with ROS nodes. Yeah, so uh, can you tell us something about it? Because I don't know what is that, that those animation nodes. No idea. Okay, uh, so so. First, uh, I probably quickly should explain how you usually animate things with, with Blender uh, or a general uh, animation software. Is uh, basically um, you do um, something called keyframing. So when you think about like um, a scene or like an, your movie or animation, you think about it in frames, which is, for example, let's say uh, you have a movie with 24 frames per second. Okay. And each frame has a certain position, like your object is in a certain position. Okay. And you animate it by defining the position uh, in certain frames. Let's say, for example, in the first frame, you want to I be see. on position zero in the C axis. And in the 20th frame, you want to be in position 10 in the C axis. And oh, between right. those two frames, you have a certain animation behavior, which can be linear, smooth, or... or uh, very like like bouncing movement and so on. There are lots of options okay. here. 
And so that would, that would be the classical approach how to animate something with Blender. Um, but on the other hand, it could be very interesting to do more, uh, use more an, an programmatic approach uh, for, mm -hmm. for animating something. And this is where the animation nodes co uh, come into play. So with, <coughs> um, with Blender 2.8, um, it's also called everything nodes, I think. Uh, so everything can be programmed with nodes and nodes here are not like ROS nodes. No. Uh, so, uh, they're completely different actually. Uh, but f from, from a structure standpoint, it's also a little bit, uh, similar actually. Uh, uh -huh. so a node is, uh, is part of, um, graphical representation actually of a program. Uh, let's say for example, in the case of the animations, you have one node uh, which um, has an output which can be thought of something like a ROS topic, uh, uh, which is a publisher, and it publishes the current key position, for example, okay. which is one, two, three, four, five, and you have another node uh, which uses this key position to transform it in a object position, for example. Okay. Let's say it multiplies it by ten, and this is the C position of the object. Exactly. So when you're at frame 10, you have a C position of, of, of 100, for example. Ah, and you okay. can use this to programmatically uh, build up something like a program, a robot program. Yeah, and so this, you're concatenating, in my opinion, yeah. So you're concatenating those blocks one after another. Yes. And then you connect the output, the, the publisher of one to the subscription of the other, let's say in raw terminology mm -hmm. it's something different we know but it's just to understand so you create those blocks each one is producing a kind of data and then you use this data to 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 manage the whole uh, animation to build the whole animation exactly so yeah uh, so it's recomputed at every frame at every uh, frame and it can be have any kind of complexity so it's let's say for example you can use it to when you, when you think about complex animations, you can use it to uh, create something uh, which builds up hundreds of objects uh, programmatically uh, and so on. But you can could also use it to, let's say, program some kind of path or some kind of uh, behavior, uh, um, animation behavior you want to have with your uh, object. And I think that's very interesting for or in general, this approach is very interesting as uh, for programming, not only when it comes to animation, but also uh, this approach could be reused for graphical programming uh, of any kind of, uh, kind of uh, sort, not only for animation programming, but also for behavior programming of a robot. Of uh, role, yeah. This is a future thing, uh, future talk here, but <laughs> in theory, you could use this not node-based, uh, such a node-based system um, to do... Um, more industrial engineering based uh, uh, programming where you have uh, the program in blocks or something something similar to the ross blockly the, the the google uh graphical programming language yeah. but but not not um like a like a software program translated directly into uh code blocks you wouldn't have an if block for example but more something uh more higher level, let's say a block that does um, moving the end effect from one position to another, and then you yes, can apply or, uh, to different to different industrial robots. The same program can actually be be applied to different robots because yeah, it's it's only adapt it's adapting the, the the data because it's a higher level, so it's adapting the data by just taking into account the end effect or. In that case. Well, okay, so uh, <laughs> I think that we are getting into too much detail on audio and it's becoming a little bit complex. But I hope that you yes. guys are, are listening and understood more or less how it works. Uh, otherwise, you can always contact Alexander on his uh, address that I will put up beneath the notes of the, of the podcast to contact him. Let's move to another, to another uh, question that is uh, how to visualize the movement. So uh, when you create a, a movement of this kind, you are visualizing that inside Blender, I suppose. But is it possible to visualize that outside the Blender itself? 
Yeah, uh, <clears throat> of course you can use animated in, in Blender and render it to a movie or a, pro a product presentation of your robot, for example. Uh -huh. uh, but to be generally useful also outside of Blender, uh, we need to first convert the animation to something uh, we can use in a real robot. And here, the, the way I've currently implemented is basically um, we're streaming out or creating from the uh, um, blend animation, we're creating a ROS trajectory out of this. So uh, right now, I've implemented uh, ROS uh, basically on the Blender side. Uh, Blender itself can be programmed in Python. So in Python. it's, okay. I think, mostly written in C++ and Python. Um, I think big parts of the UI are written in Python. There are some parts, especially the animation related and, and also uh, graphic related parts, which are yeah, more written in C++. Um, but the nice thing is everything there is like programmable, really everything. So it's uh, also a little bit self-documenting when it comes to the API. So when you click on a button, you see which API call you would, ha would co need to call to, to click this button, for example, That's which great. is really cool. Um, but there's a downside here. Everything runs inside uh, one Blender uh, thread, like the, the Python program runs in one thread. So you can't use it to do the heavy lifting, or you can't use it to run a ROS node inside Blender. Oh. Um, so yeah, so in this case, we need uh, to have a workaround. Um, and for this purpose, I'm streaming out the animation data. Um, okay. We are a very basic uh, Serum queue socket to um, a local ROS node, which listens on one side uh, with Serum queue. Uh, I, I just used Serum queue because I already use it for other projects so, so, and so on. There's so no, what, is, what is that? Uh, yeah. Serum queue. What, what is what is that? Ah, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Serum queue is a low lightweight messaging library. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. It is basically can do like peer to peer communication. Um, ah, okay. And you, you don't need the server to be up before the client. So it uh, supports both ways. It's also publish subscribe. Uh, it also supports publish subscribe. And that's what I used here. Uh -huh. So basically, I'm publishing here uh, in Rust terms again. I'm publishing here my animation uh, data right, right to um, my Rust node with the Serum queue socket. And the, the ROS node translated uh, this raw data, which is basically XYZ position. Ah, no, sorry, it's not XYZ positions. It's uh, joint positions, basically. And okay. translating these joint positions and timestamps into a trajectory message. Uh, okay. And this trajectory message is then streamed uh, into uh, as a ROS message and right into ROS control and where it can be executed uh, okay. on the real robot. Beautiful. Yeah, okay, so at the end, you are controlling the real robot in ROS from the animation that you have created in Blender and everything together, yes. the whole pipe. Okay, that's nice. And also, exactly, you yeah. could, for example, could use even Arbis to uh, to connect to that topic that you, your note is publishing and then visualize in in Arbis the result yes so if you execute it of course you will instantly see it also in the simulation uh, for non-physical robot um, and you could use this also to visualize it in Arbis or uh, record it as a ROS bag or something and exactly. replay it later on if you want later yeah. Oh, okay, okay, that's that's great because I wanted to know. We have been talking here about Blender all the time about the industrial robot, but uh, I mean, this is a Ross developers podcast. Where where is Ross here? Yeah. <laughs> so here is where Ross uh, is is connected. And please, can can you explain us a little bit more about this uh, node that you have created? So how how does it? Do you explain uh, if I have correctly understood this node? It's uh, compiling with zero mq in order to create the, the communication subscriber that receives the data from the publisher in blender and then yeah and then there in the inside so 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 it's it's right now it's like a very simple python node uh, yeah. so it's the python zero mq library and imports also uh raspi of course and 
then it's 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 it started up and it's waiting and li it's listening on uh, for Serum Q messages on one side. On the other side, it has a ROS publisher. Okay. Um, and which kind of, have of, of message it's publishing there? It's a message for all four. You, you mentioned about that. The, uh, I, the, the bit that I, I missed is the one of the connection with the ROS control part. Yes. Okay. It's, uh, I think it's called joint, traject, uh, joint position trajectory message, if I'm right. It's, it's okay. the one used by ROS control uh, for the position control. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, trajectory control, I think. Only. Uh, it's... Well. The one. I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The one. J check the documentation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you can have it. Basically, it supports position velocity. And you, you, the more detailed your message get, the more um, it will be like the, the You can basically um, use the uh, t tweak cross control. So your yeah, anima or basically not the animation, but your execution of your trajectory. Uh, adapts to whatever you need. Right now, I'm using uh, velocity and uh, um, position and velocity as as input. But you can also uh, add acceleration, of course. Um, so it can get more detailed. And right now, I'm using a position control in my example setup. Uh, but I think it will also use for uh, velocity control or anything else. Uh, um, yeah, so it's it's basically a standard message for them. You know, okay, so. okay, I, I got it. Then the the whole structure. Now I hope that the mm -hmm. listeners also, uh, with some extra data. And then uh, just one uh, small thing, a clarification is that you mentioned that you are using, for the ROS control part, you are using machine kit. That I don't know what is this machine kit. I, I suppose that is something very specific to the robot that you you have. So in order to be able to communicate with the real robot that you have, is mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes. So machine kit is actually like it's an open source uh, motion control software. Mm. Uh, so it's usually used, uh, for example, it can be used for uh, for all sorts of mo motion control applications. Uh, but uh, one example would be like CNC machines. So it's actually um, was created for, for CNC machines and 3D printers and so on. Uh, but recently in a, in a customer project, uh, we've applied it also for robotics. So what it what it does, um, it's, it's basically the low level uh, driving layer uh, before the hardware. So uh, there's ROS, which creates the high-level messages, like a projector mm -hmm. message. Uh, with uh, ROS control, we, we create the, the positions, output positions, velocities, and so on. Uh, but we need some way to translate it uh, to the hardware. Mm -hmm. And uh, machine kit is basically this layer between uh, the high-level software and the, uh, and the hardware itself. Okay. So it has different drivers for uh, different... Uh, motion control um, hardware, or, or actually depending on on what what you're using, it can also directly drive like something like a motor or something, if if you want to. Uh, so it's a general and abstraction layer between the the software and the hardware itself. I see. Okay. Like hardware, yeah, hardware in terms of uh, of, of motion control hardware, like let's say a motor, uh, like a AC servo. Or in our case, it's an EtherCAD drive, uh, which we or six uh, EtherCAD drives in one scenario. Or in, for my particular robots, it's six uh, AC servos driven uh, via some motion control cards itself. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and you have uh, I have seen on your on your post that you have uh, the code also for the ROS control uh, and the HAL ROS control nodes that you have created for the communication of everything. So I will put a yep. link on the notes of the podcast so for anybody so that can go there and check the code and try to apply to their own robot. Maybe with some drivers, modifications with some drivers from ROS Industrial for other robots. Maybe it will also work. I don't know. If you listeners, you are uh, listening to this and you are trying to something, some another a different robot, then uh, please let us know. We'll like to know uh, improvements or changes. And uh, then uh, let me see. Um, yeah, so uh, something about your um, 
so you mentioned that Blender can have a huge potential for for robotic simulation. In and then, in which sense do you mean that? Because uh, Blender, I mean, is not a, a physics simulator, if I have understood correctly. So uh, it's more about uh, yeah, what well, you mentioned animations, but not about processing sensors. Uh, so getting data from the sensors and mm, reproducing the physical. Uh, interactions of the different elements of the simulation. So, how do you see Blender as a, uh, as a, for example, as a tool for improving simulations or enhancing simulation? Uh, so, I f think one uh, one quick uh, future application of, of Blender, or in in general rendering software, uh, is uh, training vision. So, uh, or testing vision or uh, in general machine learning. Mm -hmm. Because if you take a look at what ca can be done with Blender or with uh, 3D rendering software in general, is can create really photorealistic uh, scenes uh -huh. or photorealistic you. renderings. Uh, so, of course, uh, if you have the raw data for, for, for machine learning, which is like, you need a lot, um, then it's great. But in most scenarios, you probably will not. So you, no, exactly. you would need to have a, it's a lot of work to get the, the data, input data. So one potential application I see here is actually uh, to train algorithms with photorealistic renderings. Of course, it's not not exactly like like the uh, reality, like reality, but 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 it can be very close. So it's um, if you are training something that needs to detect, like let's say a, a flower, so uh, yeah. or or some kind of uh, plant or something, you can create a three D uh, model of, of this plant and you can create a photorealistic rendering or lots of photorealistic renderings and use it for uh, training your algorithms. So I think in, in general there's a, a huge uh, potential here for that's doing a very this, good this point. kind of, uh, uh, of stuff. Yeah. yeah, That's a very good point because uh, also you can even simulate the, when you are capturing this data you can even simulate the movement, the animation that the robot will have in general, like for example, a drone that is moving, so you can simulate the the animation. Well, you can use the animation to get the data from the camera at the same time that the animation is being played. So it will be more closer to the what the real robot would get. Yes, you, you, basically it's used for animations and, and making movies and everything. So. Uh, the, the very interesting thing with Blender 20 it is uh, the new rendering in engine. Uh, it's called uh, EEV EE EVE. Um, is um, basically can do almost photorealistic, so it can be very detailed renderings at at at, at runtime. So the, the previous rendering engines always uh, needed some time to co compute everything, and the new rendering engine. Um, it's more like a game engine uh, in itself, yeah. so it get res you get results instantly. Of course, yeah. they're not as detailed as, as the real renderings, uh, for which we would use a different uh, rendering engine, but you can uh, get very good results. And so that could be a first start for your for either testing out your your um, vision, uh, computer vision algorithms, or your machine learning algorithms, or even training them. So of course, here we need very detailed data or uh, and everything, but um, I've heard in in some uh, some papers that uh, it's already been done. Uh, so so training machine learning algorithms with uh, computer generated data because you can have uh, more deviations than you would have no, uh, in a normal scenario. Let's say you're always driving around the same block and you're training <laughs> your uh, your auto yes. autonomous driving algorithm. Suddenly you get um, um, Alias data in your, in your uh, machine learn in your data, uh, basically in your uh, training set that you wouldn't think even think about because you're always doing the same thing, uh, and and so you can use the software to, to automatically randomize the um, the input data a little bit, uh, so get right. better results in the end. Correct. Uh, I know that's already done for in for for training um, uh, machine learning algorithms. So I think there's a huge potential here for using something like Blender or 3D rendering software, or even maybe some game engines to uh, to use to create the, uh, the input data for these algorithms itself, yeah. 
Yeah, the, what you mentioned about the training with variations, it, it, it's called uh, domain randomization. And what it means is that uh, you, you generate the same data with a small modifications, a small or big, it can also be big, like for example, the light, the colors, the textures, the sizes, even the sizes of, of the different elements in the scene. So you make the robot uh, do the task, learn to do the task in those uh, conditions that are varying all the time. And that's the technique that is called domain randomization. And actually, we, we, do, we did that, uh, some months ago, the reproduction, the reproduction of that paper that it's, it's created by the people from OpenAI. And they were using a fetch robot to identify where there is the spam box in a table with uh, several element destructors. And then they needed to, to do this, uh, generating a large database with different elements on the table, with changing positions, changing colors, changing illuminations. So, um, uh, we actually provided this code for, for anyone, but it's based on Gazebo instead of Blender. So we are generating the different setups, then we create the database, and then we train on this database the visual system of the robot. And then at the end, the, the visual system of the robot is able to identify the spam in any location of the table, even with many distractors around there that could be whatever, the distractors because it becomes like uh, immune to the distractions. So that's a, that's a very good point. I never thought about using Blender for that because it's, it's closer, exactly. So you can generate the data that the algorithm is going to need and you don't need the physics for that. Exactly. I mean, that, that's the, 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 the interesting thing about Blender since it's actually like a modeling and rendering software uh, and not um, a simulation software. You have all, all the tools that you need to create uh, all sorts of virtual environments. Uh, so that's that's uh, one problem I have sometimes with uh, with Rust and, and general like simulation softwares that it's great for for simulation and everything, but you you need another tool to to build the scene up. Uh, yes. And so with Blender, you can do everything in, in one tool, which is really cool and uh, it's very quick as well. So if you're uh, trained with Blender or say if you have some some have some practice in it, uh, you can get very quick in, in creating really nice scenes. So if someone is interested here, some uh, check out the, the tutorials from, from a guy called Blender Guru on, on YouTube. Blender he does Guru. crazy things in, in just one hour. He creates a whole a metro station and things like that. So it's very fascinating. Okay, I will put the link for that on the, in the notes of the program. Okay, Alexander, so we have reached the final question and I left the final question, the, the, hot, the hottest topic of Blender. So that point that everybody is complaining about on Blender, which is what, what is happening with the Blender user interface? So why is so <laughs> difficult? Well, yeah, that was one of the, the I think one of the most uh, like especially people coming from other kind of uh, uh, software, animation uh -huh. software, three D rendering software, whatever, uh, we're all complaining about the user interface. It's so complicated, and and, and yeah. uh, nobody can use it. Uh, it's uh, yeah, and, and, um, <laughs> uh, that's absolutely true. I mean, I've I myself I've tried Planner years ago. I I couldn't do it, uh, <laughs> but I, but I think if you if you get used to it, you probably can work with it. I mean, there are lots of people who can do it, uh, but that's the nice thing about Blender 2.8. It's like a whole redesign. It's like really they're starting uh, everything uh, more or less from scratch. So the user uh -huh. interface is really a lot more modern and very uh, user-friendly, uh, especially compared to the old user interface. And okay. uh, yeah, if, if you're interested in, in graphics and, and uh, user interfaces and so on, you yeah. might even check out the, like the, the Python APIs. You can build up new menus and so on, also for Blender. And this is really the cool thing. So in the future, we could build um, also for this, this Blender plugin, basically, you can build up all sorts of menus uh, that are necessary to do programming and so on. So okay. uh, also to support the programming, not only using 
Blender animations, uh, but also like some dedicated um, tools and so on. So it's really uh, very accessible. Uh, you, you have but tried of course, already. Yeah. Yeah. You have tried already. Yes, uh, I've the... created a new menu for 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 for. Oh, okay. Uh, for this, basically, uh -huh. uh, where you can move the joints uh, with uh, with values or with a slider, compared to usually you wouldn't do that because normally when you animate something in Blender, you usually would uh, do the keyframe animation where you set uh, use the inverse kinematics and so on, and you wouldn't necessarily want to move uh, a joint or a, a bone by hand uh, with a slider while you. But it's easy to add a new menu to do that. And it's really great because it's very extensible. Um, yeah, and I think there's a huge uh, opportunity here for uh, Blender 2.8 and everything. If, you get, if you're just getting started, if you want to check out Blender, you should, should definitely use Blender 2.8 because everything you previously knew about Blender is, 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 <laughs> is history. Okay, ca ca just, yeah. uh, just one thing that I didn't catch is about the name that you mentioned, Blender. What is the name, Blender, of this new version, Blender? It's uh, two point eight. Is the two point eight? Okay. It's the name. Right. Yeah, it's it's interesting that they used two point eight and not three point zero or something, uh, because it's confusing if you're new to Blender. I think. <laughs> well, in, uh, I think that this is going yeah. in their in their line, so that's a, their style. So. <laughs> I think, but anyway, anyway, know, the, yeah. the the software I can tell you I I have tried many times for for creating the models and then it's amazing it's super stable doesn't crash, does what it it has to do so and and I have tried in Linux and Mac and both of them very very smooth so I highly recommend it also, I like it very much, and that's the end of the interview uh, we have been speaking here for fifty minutes already so <laughs> I think it's time to finish. Yes, and have some uh, some yeah, dinner. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, one question: yeah, Are you going to too. attend? Uh, yeah, you too. Yeah, because we are in the same time zone. I think. Uh, are you going to attend the Ross uh, Con in, in China this year? Oh, yeah. uh, I'm thinking about it. Uh, I was in Madrid last year. Yes, it was very great. Um, but yeah, China is like uh, a thought more because it's, it's of course it's far away. Uh, yeah as well yeah but uh, I'm thinking about it so yeah I, I haven't decided yet but okay uh, okay so okay. I, I hope we have the chance to meet in person there yeah yes yeah <laughs> thank you very much Alexander thank you okay thank you much this and for all the listeners Remember that if you want to learn ROS fast, there is no better place than the Robot Ignite Academy. At the Robot Ignite Academy, you will learn ROS online, practicing in an integrated web environment that contains the lessons, the simulations, and the code development tools. Everything is integrated inside a web browser, so it doesn't require any installation from your site. Uh, really, it really is the fastest method to learn ROS and any other related subjects to ROS, like, uh, for example, ROS for autonomous cars, ROS for industrial robots, or machine learning applied to robotics. Have a look at this address, very simple address. It's robotignite.academy. And that is all for today. Uh, see you the next week with a new lesson from the experts. And until then, keep pushing your ROS learning.